And so another important feature of chromatin interactions that are related to tense uh, is the concept of chromatin looping. So I spent a bunch of time talking about um, how to identify uh, TAD structures in AB compartments, um, but I want to spend a little bit of time talking about one particular feature of blocks on the diagonal, and that's the so-called corner dot. And so part A of this diagram is basically showing you half of a high C heat map. So if you look closely on the previous slides, um, high C heat maps are symmetric, right? And so if you look on one side of the diagonal compared to the other, uh, they look symmetric. And the reason for that is that if you think about what the ijth entry of uh, the high C heat map represents versus the jith uh, entry of the heat map, basically the ijth and jith uh, entries in the heat map tell you about the interactions between locus i and locus j versus locus j and locus i. And so those should be the same thing um, in general anyways. Um, and so oftentimes actually when people visualize high C heat maps, they don't show the whole heat map because essentially it's half of one duplicated. And so oftentimes what you actually see is basically just half the high C heat map uh, shown as a triangle. Um, and so the x-axis here represents uh, the diagonal that we typically see on a high C heat map. And everything above it is basically just one half of the high C heat map. And so part A again shows you basically a large scale high C heat map. And you know, just like the previous high C heat maps we saw, um, you see typically a lot of blocks on the, on the diagonal corresponding to TADs and what are known as subtads. And you see larger banding structure due to the AB compartments. And so here again, I'm just showing you uh, basically two uh, basically rows below, immediately below the heat map. One, the top of which basically shows you again kind of PC1, which as you recall, tells you something about which regions are in the A versus B compartment. So here I'm just showing you PC1 um, basically colored based on whether the sign of that PC1 was positive or negative. And you can see basically the boundaries between the blue and the red segments correspond to TAD boundaries uh, in this picture. Uh, the second row basically shows you a hypothetical uh, plot about how much expression might be observed at any given locus within uh, this chromosome. And basically the point is that uh, you can see that certain TADs tend to be mostly blue or mostly red, uh, corresponding again to whether or not that TAD belongs to the A or, B, A or B compartment. So part B kind of zooms in on one larger TAD. And uh, the point of the part B of this figure is that TADs are oftentimes hierarchical. And so within one block, you might see smaller, more well-defined blocks. Um, and this is this occurs because um, when certain loops are very large and very long range across a chromosome, you can have many loops within a larger loop. And so you can see within part B of the figure that I've illustrated CTCF binding sites. And you can see that CTCF binding sites tend to occur at the boundaries between the blocks or basically where the boundaries of TADs are or subtads. Uh, and so that's because CTCF plays an important role in the formation of those uh, boundaries and of TADs in general. Part C zooms in specifically on one particular subtad from B. And basically the point here is that sometimes when you see these blocks on the diagonal, sometimes you can see a very prominent dot right at the corner of the block. So that's represented by the big point, red point at the top of the triangle in part C. And so if you think about what that point represents, that point basically says that the two genomic loci corresponding to the boundaries of this block are in close, tight interaction. And so what that means, if you think about the, if you think about the implications of that dot on the 3D structure of the chromatin of this region, you basically get a model like what I'm showing you on the right here of part C where basically that corner dot represents very close interaction of two distal genomic loci. Um, and because those two genomic loci represent the boundaries of TADs, what oftentimes you actually observe is that that corner dot represents close physical contact of the distant genomic loci that are brought together by uh, the cohesion complex interacting with CTCF.
Um, and so basically what these corner dots represent is a very tight chromosome loop um, that occurs between the boundaries of, for example, this tad. And so before we get into uh, the discussion about how cohesin and CTCF uh, potentially induce looping uh, in chromatin, I just wanted to show you a, uh, an actual real high c map shown here on the right, which corresponds to uh, a high c map derived from mouse cortical neurons. And basically on this high c map, you can basically see a couple uh, block diagonals also kind of highlighted on the high c map. Uh, with different colored lines. And where I've pointed with an arrow, you can actually see a very prominent corner dot. Um, and so not all tad, you'll see that not all tads on this diagram, or not all blocks on this diagram have a corner dot, but those corner dots that you see are very prominent and very obvious. And again, what they indicate is some kind of um, looping that is facilitated by um, cohesin and CTCF. And so on the left, um, what I'm actually showing you is uh, is basically the structure of um, the predicted model structure of chromatin when you have two different styles of uh, two different styles of corner dots. And so in part B of the figure on the left, you can see that there's kind of uh, two subtads within the block and a single corner dot up at the very top. And so what you could infer about the chromatin structure from that type of tad is that there's only one single looping event. Um, and that's kind of shown by the, uh, by the cohesin plus uh, two blue circles, which correspond to two CTCF uh, regulators. Uh, and you can see that the two subtads just correspond to two different parts of the same loop uh, that happen to interact with each other more than between the two parts of the loop. Whereas on the right half of the part B diagram, you can see that there's actually two corner dots instead of just one. Um, and so the correct chromatin model that corresponds to this uh, high C map is basically one in which there's actually two loops forming and both ends of both loops go through the same cohesion complex. And so basically on the right, you can see there's actually like four, um, four ovals corresponding to four CTCF uh, molecules. And uh, basically you can actually see that there's two different loops passing through the same cohesion molecule. And so the point here is that uh, the block structure of the high C map in conjunction with the corner dots can tell you, uh, can basically distinguish different subtle structures uh, or microstructures within the chromatin in different regions of the, of the genome. And so a big question that actually hasn't been entirely resolved is the question of how do these loops form in the first place? And so that's still, so I want to emphasize that how loops form exactly is still unknown, but there are obviously hypotheses about how loops form. And so the loop extrusion model is one common hypothesis for how loops form. And so the general idea is that, um, is that basically the cohesion complex, which is made up of a bunch of other protein domains called structural maintenance of chromosomes, uh, proteins like SMC1, SMC3, and RAD21 uh, basically come together to form cohesin, and then cohesin gets loaded onto the chromatin uh, through complexes like NIPBL. And so the idea is that once cohesin is loaded onto, um, onto the chromosome, then looping starts to happen and uh, the chromosome basically gets fed through or extrusion starts to happen. And basically extrusion keeps happening until uh, some bound, uh, until some probably bound CTCF binding sites, so those binding sites that are bound by CTCF, uh, then start physically interacting with cohesin and basically prevent extrusion from continuing. Um, and that's how, that's why CTCF bounding sites are frequently found at the boundaries of these TADs. Um, and so uh, extrusion and, and Binding by cohesin isn't a 
isn't typically a permanent event. So uh, cohesin can be released from the chromosome um, and it's typically released through the activity of regulators like WPL. So an interesting question is, um, you know, what happens to the organization of the genome when you start to perturb some of these uh, components of the uh, loop extrusion model? And so in part A of this diagram, part A basically shows you a hypothetical high C heat map along with the different blocks on the diagonal and the corner dots uh, corresponding to like a control normal functioning cell. And so the idea is that in part B, part B is uh, this diagram shows you what happens potentially if you, for example, knock down CTCF. And so the idea is that CTCF again uh, is what uh, is what stops. It, it not only stops extrusion from occurring further, but it also actually uh, serves to bring together the two distal loci into close proximity uh, within the interactions with the cohesion complex. And so one of the major, uh, one of the major features of a high C map uh, that occur when you lose CTCF interactions is that you lose that corner dot because um, uh, you don't see an enrichment of interactions between those distal loci that meet at the cohesion complex. Uh, the second thing you notice is that uh, a number of the sub-TAD structures start to disappear because again, if you don't have CTCF there to kind of explicitly stop extrusion, extrusion from happening, um, extrusion can still uh, change dynamics based, it, it potentially could change dynamics based on whether the CTCF binding site is seen there or not anyways, um, just because uh, the uh, certain parts of the cohesion complex recognize sequences that tend to co-locate with CTCF binding sites. Um, and so that's why you don't see complete loss of TAD structure, but uh, you do see loss of certain like sub TAD structures in there, for example. And so part C of the diagram shows you what happens if you uh, if you have depleted cohesion in your cell. And so basically, again, the the point of cohesion is to um, is to facilitate chromosome looping. And so if you have no looping because you have no cohesion then that basically means that you lose a lot of your TAD structure. And so basically what you see in the high C heat map for part C is uh, you, you basically lose a lot of TAD structure and um, what you end up seeing is that um, you still see by and large formation of AB compartments because you see a lot of banding in the high C map, but you lose a lot of the actual like, uh, the TAD structure. And so part D shows you what happens when you deplete WPL. So again, WPL is the uh, complex that helps release um, cohesin from the chromosome. And so the problem you have is that if you lose WPL, then you your cohesin basically doesn't get released from the chromosome. And so uh, you might get even more looping than you than you would have if you had WPL there. And so compared to part A, you can see that there's more corner dots corresponding to more looping happening. And because there's more looping happening and the looping doesn't ever get released, then what happens is that the uh, AB compartment distinction is uh, not as prominent because, um, because everything is kind of fixed in place more so than in the control cell. So I want to highlight how high C interaction maps can tell you something about how gene regulation changes under conditions and not just about the 3D structure of chromatin. So here's an example of a pair of high C maps derived from uh, the mouse liver. Uh, and it's this, I'm just showing you one piece of chromosome one. And the point here is that if you compare the uh, high C maps between these two points in the circadian clock, um, you can see that there's some fairly large scale changes in the 3D structure of the chromatin uh, in the highlighted region. And so in particular, below each, uh, below each of the zoomed in areas of the high C maps, uh, what's drawn there is an illustration of how the, how the three dimensional structure of the chromatin 
uh, can inform the model of how the different regulatory elements in that region interact with the promoter uh, of a local gene. And so the point here is that on the left at time point ZT22, uh, the 3D structure of the chromatin basically implies that there's close interactions between a pair of enhancers and the promoter of that particular gene. Whereas under Z, at the time point ZT10, uh, there's no long range physical interaction implied by the pair of enhancers to the uh, promoter gene, which suggests that at that time point, the gene is turned off. And so the point here is that looking at how TAD structure changes across cellular contexts can teach you something about how gene regulation is changing between those contexts, even if all you see is basically the 3D structure of the chromatin. Another utility of the 3C-based assays is to identify the molecular effect of uh, different types of genetic variation uh, on, on gene regulation. And so here's an example of a study that uh, identified a number of uh, structural variations, in this case, uh, like inversions and deletions, uh, in a small number of uh, human individuals uh, that were associated with limb malformations in humans. And so they wanted to understand what the effect of uh, those potential mutations were on gene regulation. And so what they did is that uh, they ran a series of experiments uh, in mice, where for the corresponding region in mouse, uh, they engineered uh, similar mutations in the mouse genome and tested the effect of those mutations using the 4C assay. And so part A in this diagram shows you the wild type locus in mouse. Uh, and also drawn on the diagram is the boundaries of a TAD that was identified through 4C and HI-C. So the idea here is that in parts B and C and D, uh, what they did is they introduced different mutations that they found in the humans with, uh, with the rare limb malformations. What they found in each one of these three cases is that when they introduced the uh, uh, corresponding mutation using CRISPR, uh, you can see that each one of these mutations that they investigated uh, involved some kind of structural variant that crosses the TAD boundary. And so you can see uh, in part B, for example, that the 4C assay tells you that um, the genomic regions around PAX3 uh, have a lot of self interactions, but they don't have any interactions that really cross uh, into the uh, into the TAD region. But after you uh, delete part of the three prime boundary, then you get uh, you get physical interactions between uh, one of the enhancers in the PAX3 locus and the region inside the TAD. And the same holds for parts C and D as well. And so the main point here is that uh, using assays like 4C, HiC, and so on, uh, you can uh, engineer mutations and, and basically investigate the molecular effect of, of genetic variation.